and I think that God His Son not sparing sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that You be with us this morning. Help us, Lord, as we try to set the record straight concerning the purity and holiness of Your Son. I pray that You'd help me to be quick of thought and clear of word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Uh, before we get into the defense uh, of Jesus Christ and dispel some myths about Him, I'm going to read you uh, some of what the fools in our society, in our world, are saying, just to get you good and upset, mm. and uh, then we will work on refuting these things. Quote, this, th I didn't have to look very far. I thought, you know, I'm going to go on the internet. I, I could tell you what these people are saying, but I want to get a quote or two because that way it solidifies that we're not just uh, shooting at straw men. So here's uh, a quote from a fool who doesn't know what he's talking about. Quote, now, if Jesus had fellowship with tax collectors and sinners in order to preach to them, the Pharisees would not have fussed. After all, who would have objected that tax collectors and sinners were forsaking their sinful lifestyle, making restitution, and seeking a life of righteousness? The Pharisees believed that God offered forgiveness when sinners repented. They could even rejoice that a wretched sinner saw the light and was converted from a life of debauchery. But what infuriated the Pharisees was that Jesus was not explicitly or directly asking tax collectors and sinners to do any of this. Some of them, no doubt, did repent, such as Levi, but Jesus seems to have accepted them as they were and was freely having dinner with them without requiring that they first clean up their lives. Of course, Jesus did have a message to proclaim to them, but His message was not, quote, straighten up your life and keep the law, end quote. Rather, His message was, quote, the kingdom of God is yours, you are included, end quote. By eating with them, he was extending to them the kingdom of God. When we read about the protest of the Pharisees, we are quick to condemn them and to side with Jesus. But if Jesus were physically present in our world today, would we as church people be comfortable if he spent his time with cheats and swindlers, sexually deviant individuals, gays and lesbians? Would we not be infuriated if he constantly went to their dinner parties and didn't come to ours? Wow. This is the kind of garbage that's being presented today. Here's another quote. Another, another person altogether. A Jesus who loves us even when we don't love back. A Savior who pursues us even as we run away. A Christ who offers fellowship to all indiscriminately without condition, no strings attached. That would be a Jesus who is better than we've imagined. And that would be good news. Mm -hmm. And that's just a small part of what the fool said. Uh, we don't have time to read all what they say. We want to know what God says. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the holiest Jew ever. In 2 Corinthians 11, 1, a verse we've covered numerous times because it's a good foundation for what we're dealing with. Uh, Paul says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity or the singleness, single devotion uh, to Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, is that a possibility? Paul thought so. Mm -hmm. Whom we have not preached. And if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So in the process of exposing the false Christs, it is important to dispel myths about Jesus and establish the truth from God's word about the holy, sinless, and the perfect life of Christ and his obedience to God's law. Yeah. The modern false teachers paint uh, Jesus as going down with the harlots and the whoremongers hang out, attending their booze party, eating and drinking with them so he could witness to them. Well, some of them believe that he didn't even do it to witness to them. He just wanted to practice friendship and show them acceptance. Mm. To, one of them said that uh, if he was doing it just to witness to them, that would be manipulation. It wouldn't be a true friend. It's like, get a life. So they redefined holiness to only be feelings of love. 
And carnality is equated with being judgmental and unaccepting of others. So living after the flesh then is redefined so it has nothing to do with what you eat, drink, outward appearance, fads, fashions, use of alcohol or tobacco. It is only in the realms of intolerance, judging, unforgiveness, and not sending their money to that ministry, of course. Mm -hmm. They wish to paint Jesus as a good old boy who could drink with the sinners as well as discuss theology with the priest and was equally comfortable in both places. And as long as he had love in his heart, he was still pleasing to God. They wish to paint Jesus as not having scruples of separation and standards of outward holiness because they teach that only the heart matters. And the heart can be clean without affecting the cleanliness of the outside, they say. <coughs> Is this all true? Well, let's lay some historic groundwork. We're going to read a lot of Scripture. Because I don't doubt a bit that the false concepts of Jesus have actually affected your thinking some. And I'm going to prove some things from the Word of God that might surprise you about Jesus Christ. Luke 1, 5 will begin. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. This is very important. Look at who God chose for Christ forerunners, parents. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, which indicates he would be a Nazarite. Mm -hmm. And he should be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, which means he would be a lifelong Nazarite. That's the implication here. And many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make a people ready uh, uh, ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, in order to prepare people for their Messiah, they had to turn back to God. They had to turn back to God's law. What do you think they were disobeying? Back to the wisdom of the just, the just ones, which were the ones following God's law. A people prepared for the Lord. So a people prepared so that they would recognize the Lord. A people prepared so that they would appreciate yes. the Lord. In Malachi 4.1, a verse we've read before, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Which is probably what that lady read. Yep. The wings was referring to the borders of their garments. And she thought, if I could just touch that border, I'd be healed. Right. She probably read this and thought, this is, this is what I need to do. And he shall go forth and grow up as calves. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I command, commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold... I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, uh, Elijah would come and the Messiah would come, as we're going to read in just a minute in the previous chapter of Malachi, to turn people back to God's law. Isaiah 40, verse 3, John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And Isaiah 43 is what he's quoting. It says, Prepare ye the way of Jehovah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be exalted, and every mountain and hill should be made low, and the crooked should be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Um, so this is uh, what they were expecting from the prophets in the Old Testament. Jesus came as the purifier of God's people and God's program. Turn to Luke chapter 3. 
We're going to lay this groundwork and then we're going to get in directly into the issues at hand. But it's important to get a grip on who these people were, who God chose. And in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. Now in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Idaea, and of the region of Trechonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the country of Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's what John said to the publicans, the harlots, the Pharisees, the rulers, everybody, the multitudes, all of them, okay? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. This was the man who was supposed to pre prepare people for Jesus Christ. In Malachi 3.1 we have God saying about this situation. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, saith the Lord. That's John, whom ye shall seek. Uh, and the Lord whom ye shall seek, which is the Messiah, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming? Because after all, he's going to come and break down all the rules, right? Is that what it says? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What do we, how do we define righteousness, guys? Let's read on. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith Jehovah of hosts, for I am Jehovah, I change not. Amen. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from my ordinances. That's how we define righteousness. Mm -hmm. And have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, so the, the Jewish mind, the one who knew the word of God, was expecting a forerunner to come who was to turn people back to God. Get people right with God. Get them back to the law. Get them back to obeying Moses' law and the ordinances. And then the Messiah was going to come in a more intense fashion yeah. as refiner's fire, as fuller's soap, with the same purpose, the same goal, and the same message. That's right. <clears throat> and what was the New Covenant all about anyways? Most people today don't even know what the New Covenant was about. Nope. Jeremiah 31, 33, which is quoted twice in the New Testament, but this should be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Jesus came as the most upright, strict, scrupulous, devout, law-abiding Jew that ever lived. Amen. He didn't break the least commandment in God's law, but taught and lived them perfectly. That's right. The difference was, in him and some of the ascetics of his day, his strictness, his scruples, his separation, his holiness and devotion was perfectly in tune with God. That's Amen. right. Theirs was not. When tempted of Satan, Jesus was tempted to satisfy his hunger apart from the will of God. He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay? And that's exactly how he lived. He did not come to repeal Judaism. He came to purify it. Amen. Matthew 23, 1, Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, which was a seat uh, uh, created by God himself. God created this seat. God ordained this program. They were in a God-ordained place of authority. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. The apostles practiced biblical Judaism to the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. Jesus established a congregation of believing Jews purified, as Malachi said. They were renewed as in days of old, as in former years. Not some new thing, but taking them back to the original design That's that right. God had for them. They were zealous of the law like no other Jew, Jew could be. Because now they had met the author of the law. Now they understood that Jehovah became the Lamb to redeem His people. Now they saw how it all fit. They understood what Abraham meant when he said God should provide Himself a Lamb. And uh, they understood all that so much better now because they met the Lamb of God. They met the author of the law. And He died for them. Acts 21, 18, And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. This is 29 years after Pentecost. And all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. That's exactly what Malachi said that Jesus would do. Right. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Was that true? Most of ignorant Christendom today would say, well, yes. Paul told them they're not under the law, but they're under grace. Paul told them to forsake Moses. That was Old Testament. We're in a new covenant now. Most of ignorant Christendom would say that. Yeah. But James didn't believe that, neither did Paul. No. He said, that's what they've heard. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say unto thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Then take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them. This was a like a Nazarite vow, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, mm -hmm. but that thou thyself walkest orderly and keepest the law. Amen. Well, they must not have understood Jesus. <laughs> As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication or immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, which would be the Nazarite vow, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. They took the Nazarite vow, and they let their hair grow for a certain time, and then they shaved their head. Jesus did not change anything concerning what God's Word commanded to the Jewish nation. He reconfirmed all of it. God said, I am Jehovah, I change not. Jesus obeyed the moral, ceremonial, and civil laws. Jesus confirmed the moral, ceremonial, and civil laws. He didn't change anything. He'll say, well, what does that say about the Gentiles? Twelve years after Pentecost, God chose to allow believing, repentant Gentiles to come into the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? He made of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace, and broke down the middle wall of partition. But he didn't relieve the Jews from obeying Judaism. 
The only thing he relieved them of is that now they could eat with repentant, baptized, believing Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And that was 12 years after Pentecost that he opened that door and the scriptures confirmed it. It wasn't plan B. It was plan A unfolding just like he said That's it would. Right, yeah. right. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Okay. Jesus was the most devout Jew that ever lived but he was not a Nazarite. People think he had long hair. He was not a Nazarite. John was a Nazarite. Jesus was not. That's right. But Jesus was the most devout Jew that ever lived. Matthew 5, 17, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What does that mean, Jesus? For verily I say unto you that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Okay, Jesus, explain yourself. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what do you think Jesus did? Did he break the least commandment and teach men so? Or did he keep the least commandment and teach men so? Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, does it? Verse 20 says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What he is saying in these verses is, if you disregard Moses' least commandment, you will be disregarded. That's right. In other words, he's saying, I will put upon you the same importance that you put upon Moses' least commandment. He's saying, you will be treated the same way you treat God's least commandment. This is the real Jesus. That's right. Mm -hmm. Is this the one you know? Hebrews 1 8, but, but under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, defined by what? God's law. And hated iniquity, anomia, lawlessness, defined by God's law. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Most of Christendom today is lawless by virtue of their doctrine. Their right. doctrine teaches them to be lawless. Their doctrine teaches them if they're not lawless, then they're not really trusting God. They don't, they're not really under grace until they are apart from God's law. The law is over and dead and gone. Now, Jesus hates that. That's right. That's right. Now, with this groundwork we've just laid, let's dispel some myths about Jesus. First of all, Jesus did not have long hair. No. You say, but my Bible storybook shows Jesus with long hair like a woman. <laughs> First Corinthians 11, Paul declares that it was a shame for a man to wear long hair like a woman. Yep. Yeah. You say, yeah, but, 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 no, but nothing. Amen. Okay? Did the apostles properly reflect Jesus and His Word, His doctrine, His person, or not? Amen. Did they fulfill the Great Commission or not? They were to teach all nations all things whatsoever He commanded them. Would He be teaching this? Would Jesus be teaching that long hair is shame for a man if he had long hair? No. Most people would, would rather believe their, their artwork that they got from some Greek artist showing Jesus as a Greek with long hair, they'd rather believe that than the fact that the Apostle Paul knew him, saw him, yep. exactly. and knew the Apostles. A Nazarite will let his hair grow long during the course of the vow. When the vow was over, he shaved his head. Right. So, but generally, it was a shame for a man to wear long hair. Right. This was a special sign, the Nazarite vow. And it was not, it was not the norm. Had the norm been long hair, how would you recognize a Nazarite? You wouldn't. It wouldn't have been anything different or special. Those who were Nazarites for life were set apart. People knew, well, this is, this is different. This guy is, look at the, the guy with long, what's the deal here? Well, he's a Nazarite for life, that's why. It wasn't, well, that's just what everybody does. It was considered a shame, generally, for a man to wear his hair long, unless it was under some special vow. Um... Jesus was not gluttonous and a wine-bibber. No. Jesus said in Matthew eleven sixteen, 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. 
For John came neither eating nor drinking. He was a Nazarite. Nazarites didn't drink any anything product of the grape at all. Right. New, old, whatever. Vinegar, none of it. Uh, for John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, which as a normal law-abiding Jew. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous in a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, how many people today believe that John had a devil? Hmm. But they'll believe that Jesus was a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. They say it all. The, the same people were saying it. It's the yeah. same slander. Uh, Jesus is repeating their slant, slander. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in John 15, 14, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So is he being inconsistent to be a friend of publicans and sinners? Mm -hmm. They're not saying that Jesus was a friend to repentant publicans and sinners. No. That's not what they're saying. Jesus is indeed the greatest friend that any human being, which we're all sinners in that respect. He's the greatest friend we've ever had because He died for us. That's right. But He did not come practicing friendship, befriending those who were in rebellion to God or living in sin. Amen. He did not do that. Okay, I'll prove it. Um, Jesus goes on to say, but wisdom is justified of her children or by her children. The apostles were the children who justified Jesus' teaching and example. The only place to look, if you want a pure, uncorrupted, undiluted, and perfect example of the impact that Jesus made, which justifies and rightly reflects His intentions and teachings, you look at the life, the ministry, and the example of the apostles. Yes. They are the reflection of what Jesus intended to communicate. Okay? They were His trained apostles, His trained and chosen disciples. They understood Him better than anybody today. Amen. Regardless of the arrogance that is exhibited today in that realm. Hebrews 7.26 says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners yep. and made higher than the heavens. Now how can Jesus be separate from sinners and yet be accused of eating with them? Turn to Luke 19. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho and behold there was a man named Zacchaeus which was the chief among the publicans and he was rich and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Okay, is Jesus making friends with rebels, with sinners, with with those who were excommunicated out of Judaism, rightfully so? Let's read on. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, did Jesus know that that was in his heart before he called him out of the tree? Yeah. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, Jesus made a connection with this man to seek and to save that which was lost. Right. He wasn't practicing friendship. He wasn't showing them that he accepts him as he is. That's right. Zacchaeus did not think that Jesus accepted him as he was. That's right. He knew that Jesus would only accept him as he was planning to be yeah. after his repentance. Did Jesus' relationship with sinners ever serve as an enabler? No. Did it ever embolden them? Did it ever cause pride in them? Did they ever feel more accepted than they had by God before? Did Jesus hang out with sinners? That's, that's what most people try to say. Well, Jesus hung out with sinners. He hung out with, sin, with publicans and sinners and harlots and drunk, drank with them. Only one passage of Scripture mentions harlots concerning Jesus' ministry. Let's read it and look at it. Matthew 21, 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. 
And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because they're accepted where they are? No, because they repented and went. Right. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness. We already read about that, didn't we? Jesus said, John came in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. Mm -hmm. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not after that ye might believe him. He's talking about, specifically, publicans and harlots who repented at the preaching of John. That's right. In John 7, 7, Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Mm -hmm. The world hated Jesus, because he told them their works were evil. I thought he just came out and ate with them and accepted them where they were. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world hate you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Hey, you go out and sit and eat and drink with them and see if they love you. Don't condemn them. Just go out there and practice friendship with them. Show them acceptance. Tell them they're going to heaven. See if they hate you. No, they'll love you. Yep. They'll fill stadiums up to hear you speak. That's right. He said, but because you're not of the world, because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, question. Did Jesus eat with the excommunicated and associate with rebels? Most people would say yes. But Matthew 18, 17, it says, concerning uh, a, a brother who's trespassed, and if he neglect to hear them... or Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. What does that mean? Oh, I should go eat and drink with him, right? Is that what Jesus is teaching? In other words, a, a sinner and a publican. Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Well, how do the, how do the apostles understand that? 1 Corinthians 5.11 But now I have written unto you that not to keep company... If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Who understood Jesus better? You or the apostles? Second Corinthians 6.14 Be not ye unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as he has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And it will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. Did Jesus do anything contrary to that? Absolutely not. This is what he taught. This is what his apostles understood. That's right. And they say in, in uh, the next verse, Having therefore these promises, the promises that if we touch not the unclean thing, if we separate ourselves, if we come out from among the ungodly, that God will receive us. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yes. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. This was the same in Judaism. Someone who is properly excommunicated out of Judaism, Jesus would not have eaten with them. That's right. If they were excommunicated according to the law, and not just because they believed in Jesus, some people were kicked out of the synagogue just because they believed in Jesus. But if they had been excommunicated or put out lawfully, Jesus would not have eaten with them. That's right. The early church was purified Judaism with God's law in their hearts. You understand that? The early church, the first century churches, were purified Judaism with purified Jews in purified synagogues. That's right. Paul said, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. That was the teaching and example of Jesus Christ. Yep. Now let me ask you this. Did Jesus ever eat and drink with Gentiles? Turn to Acts 10.
There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Okay, here's a man who was following the God of Israel, but he had not become a bona fide Jew. Okay? He had not come under Judaism, but he was a proselyte of the gate. He probably sat in the court of the Gentiles, went to synagogue. He prayed at the proper times. Uh, when the angel came to him, uh, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Verse 4, And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Okay? So then he sent him to Peter, because he wanted him to hear words whereby he could be saved. At the same time, God said to Peter in a vision, there was a, uh, verse 11, And saw heaven open, Peter's in a trance, and a certain vessel descending unto him, and it had been a great, uh, as it had been a great sheet, knitted the four corners, led down to the earth, wherein were all manner of forfeited beasts and of, of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the earth. These are unclean animals. And there came a voice to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Oh, Peter, you never got... You were with Jesus all that time and you never figured it out? No. He was following. He, the reason he said, not so, Lord, is because he thought this is the test. He had no idea that God would ever be pleased with him breaking his law and eating something that was common or unclean. He had never done that in his whole life. He was a devout Jew. He wasn't just some old rough, cussing, uh, drinking fisherman that Jesus called to be a disciple. He was a very devout Jew. Right. And nothing uncommon or unclean had ever entered his mouth. So he thought, this is, surely this is a test. What, what's God doing? And God didn't want him to start eating unclean animals. That wasn't the point. He right. never did. Okay? But there was something else God was saying to him. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Okay. As he was pondering this, the Holy Ghost, uh, there were three men waiting for him down at the gate. The Holy Ghost um, said, Get thee down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter went with them. Uh, they told him that Cornelius, the you know, one that feareth God, of a good report of all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house. So Peter went with them. And uh, when he was coming to the house, Cornelius met him, verse 25, and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Listen, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. This was the first time that it was lawful for a Jew to go to someone of another nation. To have company with them. This was the first time Peter didn't stop and say, Oh yeah, Jesus used to do this. Jesus never did this. Jesus never did this. He taught the apostles. He never changed God's law concerning the practices of Judaism. Jesus never ate with Gentiles or company with them in a way that was contrary to the law as Peter is talking about here. Okay? It's important to understand that. These apostles understood Jesus. They fulfilled the Great Commission. They knew what Jesus meant. They understood it better than anyone today. Oh, you think what happened? The problem is this. People today, they think they know Jesus better than the apostles uh -huh. because they read the apostles' book. Uh -huh. They read what the apostles wrote, and so they think they understand it better than the ones who wrote it. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. So, no, Jesus had never taught them that it was okay just to go in and uh, eat with someone. He says... Uh, God showed me. God has showed me a, a vision from heaven. I ask therefore for what intent you have sent for me. He explains it to him. And then verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of with him. But this was new. Okay? This was a new thing. In fact, God poured out the Holy Ghost on him. Peter went back in verse 11, and they... they uh, uh, verse chapter verse chapter 11 verse 3 they contended with him 
saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. They knew that was wrong. Jesus hadn't taught them that was okay. But Peter rehearsed the whole matter from the beginning and expounded it. And when he showed that the Holy Ghost fell on us, on them as on us at the beginning, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said that John indeed baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much as then, as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It doesn't mean that he uh, predestined it and made them repent. No, what it means here is that now the door is open. Yes. That even a Gentile, without becoming a Jew, can repent and receive the Holy Ghost. This is a new thing. This has never happened before. Jesus did not eat and drink with Gentiles or anybody who was excommunicated or anybody who was living in rebellion to God's law. Amen. You say, well, Brother Mark, what does it mean? Jesus said, uh, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth the man. So, you know, what, you know Peter said, nothing common or unclean hath ever entered into my mouth. Did Jesus uh, tell, didn't Jesus tell them that it doesn't matter what you eat? Turn to Matthew 15. Let's see what Jesus told him. You say, well, I, I guess the apostles just didn't get it until 12 years after Pentecost, right? No, the fact is, they still didn't eat anything common or unclean. Right. They lived as, as separated Jews for their entire life, keeping Moses' law. We already saw that Paul did 29 years after Pentecost. Okay? So what does it mean? Matthew 15. Then came to... Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, uh, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So they were adding to the law of God. They weren't teaching the law of God. They were actually making void the law of God. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said unto them, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also without, yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly, and it cast out into the drop? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Yep. Context is everything. Amen. Okay? He wasn't teaching his disciples they could go out and eat unclean animals and violate the law of God to the Jewish nation. He wasn't doing that. No. Nope. That was not the intent of his words. The Jews, the apostles understood that. Peter, 12 years after Pentecost, said nothing ever common or unclean. Head into his mouth. He wasn't being an ascetic Pharisee. He was following Jesus. That's right. Turn to Luke 5. where it talks about Jesus eating with publicans and sinners. Luke 5, verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, that they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So he had a purpose in them coming here. But I want you to notice, Jesus did not invite this crowd. That's right. Levi did. Okay? Now, um, 
Levi did not just immediately up and leave his occupation and go make a great feast. If you study the Bible and get to know the Bible, you find out that Levi, according to the Gospel of Mark, was a son of Alphaeus. The same probably with the father of James the Less. Okay? And so, no doubt, he knew about Jesus prior to this. It's very possible that he had believed on Jesus prior to this. It's very possible and probable that he had been baptized by John the Baptist. Uh -huh. Okay? The same is true with Peter, James, and John and them. You read in John, they, they didn't start following Jesus from the fisherman boat. Okay? They were disciples of John the Baptist. They had been baptized by John the Baptist. They... Uh, saw Jesus. They were with John. Jesus passed by and John said, Behold the Lamb of God. They went after Him. And then there was Nathaniel and they went and got Nathaniel and Peter and so forth. They had already been conversing with Jesus. They had already been believing that He was the Messiah, the Son of God. He came by their fisherman boat because they were had a family business of being fishermen. And He called them into full-time discipleship. And they left their boat and followed Him. Okay? That's what happened with Matthew here. Yep. Um, Jesus is now calling him into full-time uh, ministry with him to be a full-time attendant. All right, so Matthew, no doubt, uh, closed his accounts, uh, left everything in a, in a proper order. He was a tax collector. He probably sat either by a booth to collect tax for those who came across the sea or up and down a certain road. The, the, the Romans taxed them for traveling on the roads. They taxed them for going over the sea. They taxed them for a number of things. So he was sitting in a booth and he was doing his job. But John the Baptist had told them. He didn't tell them to quit being publicans. No. He said, just exact no more than that which you ought to exact. So if they repented and were baptized by John, they could still be publicans. Yep. Okay. Matthew Levi, most likely after some time with Jesus, makes this great feast. Let me read you what... Uh, one commentary says, and I agree with it. The probability is that it did not take place till a considerable time afterwards. For Matthew, who ought surely to know what took place while his Lord was sitting or speaking at his own table, tells us that the visit of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, occurred at that moment. Matthew 9.18. But we know from Mark and Luke that this visit of Jairus did not take place till after our Lord's return at a later period from the country of the Gadarenes. We conclude, therefore, that the feast was not made in the novelty of his discipleship, but after Matthew had had time to be somewhat established in the faith, when returning to Capernaum, his companion, his compassion for an old friends of his own calling and character, led him to gather them together that they might have an opportunity of hearing the gracious words which proceeded out of the Master's mouth, if happily they might experience a like change. Um, so, after Matthew has been following with Jesus, they come back to Capernaum. He probably goes to Jesus and says, Look, I'd like to make a great feast and invite all my old associates and let them hear your teaching. Okay? And most likely the people who came, we know that a lot of the people who came were disciples of John the Baptist. We know that there were Pharisees who criticized. They, were probably just, they probably weren't invited, but they were watching the proceedings. Matthew 9-11. Matthew 9, 14, we have the disciples of John at the feast asking Jesus a question. So we know the disciples of John the Baptist were there. This was not a Christian rock concert. This was not a country western dance at the cowboy church. This was not a booze bash where Matthew promised free beer to anyone who would come and hear Jesus. It was not a tailgate party at the horse races. It was not Jesus popping a beer and telling of God's love. It was not a beach party baptizing men and women in their swimwear. This was not a heathen hog roast, a local thug hangout, or a pot party. This was a righteous Jewish feast, yes. and it was for the honor and glory of God. And during this feast, the local ruler of the synagogue shows up to ask this Messiah to come and heal his daughter. If this had been anything dishonorable to the faith of Abraham, the God of Israel, anything unlawful going on here, the ruler of the synagogue wouldn't be showing up right. asking the ruler to come and heal his daughter while he's sitting at the feast. Yep. Context is everything. Amen. Right. Jesus had a reputation as a holy rabbi of God. The people who were invited to this feast were circumcised Jews. No Gentiles. 
They were repentant and seeking to know God. They had heard John, most likely, and were curious and, and seeking and wondering. I mean, you know, some of them were disciples of John. Okay? It says right there in Matthew 9, 14. In Luke 7, 1, we find that Jesus had such a reputation as a holy and honorable rabbi that when a, the centurion, his servant was sick and ready to die, and he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. He gathered the elders of the Jews, which were probably the local rulers of the local synagogue, and sent them to Jesus, and they came to Jesus, and listen to what they said. The elders of the Jews came beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation and has built for us a synagogue. They thought that would influence Jesus because they knew him. Mm -hmm. They didn't find him at a tailgate party on the beach. Did Jesus drink wine? Yes, he even made wine. But do you know the facts of the case? This is a textbook. The one who wrote it was for many years the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. It says, J. Dwight Pentecost was a distinguished professor of Bible exposition emeritus at Dallas Theological Seminary, one of only two so honored. He held a BA from Hampton Sydney College in 1937 in addition to a THM 1941 and a THD 1956 degrees from Dallas Theological Seminary. During his academic career, he taught biblical subjects for over 60 years. Okay? Nowadays, graduates from Dallas Theological Seminary are latching on to the, the tailgate party Jesus. Yeah. The drink, eating and drinking with sinners Jesus. Okay? Every drunk uh, knows, well, Jesus drank wine. But what does it say? This is his book. Jesus made real wine out of the water. But there was a great difference between the Palestinian wine of that time and the alcoholic mixtures which today go under the name of wine. Their simple vintage was taken with three parts of water and would correspond more or less with our grape juice. It would be worse than blasphemy to suppose, because Jesus made wine, that he justifies the drinking usages of modern society with its bars, strong drinks, and resulting evils. That's right. Do you really want to know what happened? Or do you just want to know that Jesus drank wine? Quote, in ancient times, wine was usually stored in large uh, pointed jugs called amphorae. When wine was to be used, it was poured from the amphorae into large bowls called craters, where it was mixed with water. From these craters, cups or kylix were then filled. What is important for us to note is that before wine was drunk, it was mixed with water. The kylix were filled not from the amphorae, but from the craters. Um, it is evident that wine was seen in ancient times as a beverage. Yet as a beverage, it was always thought of as a mixed drink. Among the Greeks, uh, Plutarch uh, says we call a mixture wine, although the larger uh, of the components part is water. Um, the ratio of water might vary, but only barbarians drank it unmixed, and a mixture of wine and water of equal parts was seen as strong drink and frowned upon. The term wine, or onos, in the ancient world then did not mean wine as we understand it today but mixed wine mixed with water usually a writer simply referred to the mixture of water and wine as wine to indicate that the beverage was not a mixture of water and wine uh, he would say unmixed wine in the bible in revelation it says the wrath of god the the wine of the wrath of god is poured out without mixture in other words god's wrath will be undiluted okay they made a point there in the Talmud, which contains the oral traditions of Judaism from about 200 B.C. to A.D. 200, there are several tractates in which the mixture of water and wine is discussed. One tractate states the wine that does not carry three parts of water well is not wine. The normal mixture is said to consist of two parts water to one part wine. Um, in a most important reference, it is stated that the four cups of every Jew that every Jew was to drink during the Passover ritual were to be mixed with a ratio of three parts water to one part wine. In ancient times, there were not many beverages that were safe to drink. The danger of drinking water alone raised, raises another point. There were several ways in which the ancients could make water safe to drink. One method was boiling, but this was tedious and costly. 
Different methods of filtration were tried. The safest and easiest method of making the water safe to drink, however, was to mix it with wine. The drinking of wine, in effect, a mixture of water and wine, served therefore as a safety measure since often the water available was not safe. The rabbi said any unblessed food was unclean and would defile the eater. They taught that wine, unless mixed with water, could not be blessed. The rabbis debated how much water uh, must be added before wine could be blessed. Some contended that three parts of water and one part of wine could be blessed. Others demanded that ten parts of water and one part of wine mixed before it could be blessed. You really want to know the truth? Oh, Jesus drank wine. What did he drink? He drank a lawful, upright beverage of the day called wine. That's right. Now the graduates from these college are out drinking beer and liquor and, and uh, their Bloody Marys and their whiskey and their margaritas because Jesus drank wine. Mm -hmm. Do you know that distilled liquors didn't even exist until the 9th or 10th century? An Arab chemist came up with it. Here's a note from uh, Albert Barnes. Distilled spirits were not then known. The art of distilling was discovered by an Arabian chemist in the 9th or 10th century, but distilled liquors are not used by the Arabians, yeah, they're too smart. Mm -hmm. They banish them at once as if sensible of their pernicious influence, nor are they used in Eastern nations at all. Europe and America have been the places where these poisons has been most extensively used, and there it has beggared and ruined millions, and is yearly sweeping thousands unprepared into a wretched eternity. Yep. Excessive alcohol consumption cost the United States $223.5 billion. That was the number calculated in 2006. About $1.90 per drink, about $746 per person. That's what excessive alcohol consumption costs our nation. You ask any of those drunks, you go and talk to them about, you shouldn't be drinking this stuff, this is wicked, this is ungodly. They'll say, but Jesus drank wine. You want to know, let me read to you what Adam Clark said about him telling Timothy to use a little wine for his stomach's sake. Okay? This is just an excerpt of, you can go read the whole thing later. Clark says, Among the Greeks and Romans, the state of youth, or adolescence, was extended to 30 years, and no respectable young man, young men were permitted to drink wine before that time. It's still a mixture of water and wine, Okay? Allowing that Timothy was about 20 when Paul had him circumcised, which was, according to Calumet, in the year of our Lord, 51, and that this epistle was written about A.D. 64 or 65, then Timothy must have been about 35 when he received this epistle. And as that was on the borders of adolescence, and as the scripture generally calls that youth that is not old age, Timothy might be treated as a young man by St. Paul, as in the above text, and might still feel himself under the custom of his country relative to drinking wine, for his father was a Greek, and through the influence of his Christian profession still continued to abstain from wine, drinking water only, which must have been very detrimental to him, his weak state of health considered, the delicacy of his stomach, and the excesses of his ecclesiastical labors. So all Paul was asking him to do was mix some wine with the water right, for the sake of his health. All of God's law was designed to promote in society health, wealth, justice, love, and holiness. That's right. None of it was a loophole for sin or debauchery or the goofiness that we see around us today. Yeah. God's law was given so sincere, God-fearing leaders could maintain holiness in society. Any other interpreta interpretation or use of the law is abuse. Deuteronomy 4.40. Listen up. Don't let me lose you. Okay, listen up. Deuteronomy 4.40. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 5.33 Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye go to possess. Deuteronomy 6.3 Hear therefore, O Israel, 
and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that he may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Deuteronomy 6.18 and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers. Deuteronomy 12, 28. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. Now listen to Jesus. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew twenty two thirty six. They said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Most likely thinking the Decalogue. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Yes. And Jesus wasn't coming to teach anything contrary to that. That's right. He just established that point. In other words, Jesus is saying all the law and the prophets define for us and yes. teach us how to love God and love man properly. That's right. Okay? We are not to define them differently. Romans 8, 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law of the law yep. might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit you don't need to go ask Joel Osteen and, and uh, uh, Paula White or any of the Joyce Meyer or any of these people out there today you don't need to ask them a definition of love go look at Zachariah and Elizabeth if you want to know a definition yeah. of love Amen. you want to know a definition of righteousness in the eyes of God go look at Zachariah and Elizabeth they knew what it meant. Yes. Zechariah and Elizabeth produced John the Baptist, who was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. There's no conflict among any of them. Amen. Amen. The apostles' words must be defined in the light of the righteousness of the law. When the apostles say, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, uh, not with broidered hair, gold, pearls, or costly array, but which become as women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. All of this must be defined in the light of God's law, yeah, the righteousness right. of the law. Yeah. You don't define the terms your own way. Amen. Titus 2.1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness. How do we define that? By the law. Yep. The righteousness of the law. Amen. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, not given to much of this water and wine mixture. You'd have to drink an awful lot of that stuff to actually become tipsy and, and be in, intoxicated. But if you drink enough of it, it could happen. You'd have to drink an awful lot, though. Do you know, I learned in Bible college, they said, they were teaching on this, and they said if you drank a, over much grape juice, then it could ferment in your stomach and cause uh, a, 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 an intoxication of sorts. Grape juice can do that. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. How do we define all that? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Jesus lived an every word life. He wants you to live an every word life. Yes. Every word doctrine. Have an every word church. Yes. You can't just go and they say, well, you know, we're comparing it to this or that, we just it's all about love. No. You need to define love by God's law. Amen. Pattern of good works, gravity, sincerity, sound speech. Jesus was holy, spotless, just, 
He fulfilled every part of God's law. That means He never said what He shouldn't say. That means He never ate or drank what was unlawful to eat or drink. That means He never accompanied with those it was unlawful to company with. That means He never did that what He shouldn't do or went where He shouldn't go. He never coveted what He shouldn't covet. He never bore false witness against His neighbor. He never took God's name in vain. He never did what was unlawful to do on the Sabbath day. He never violated one jot or tittle of the moral or ceremonial or civil law of God. Not Amen. one time. That's right. He was without spot. He was a perfect demonstration of the law of Moses. That's right. God's law. And by the way, none of that was imputed to anyone. Nope. All of this holiness, all of this righteousness and purity was not imputed to anyone but Jesus. That's right. So He could qualify as a spotless lamb. To die vicariously for your sin. Yes. His purity, His holiness, His righteousness was on His record. Nobody is ever seen as holy and pure and righteous as Jesus was. Amen. Nobody. Amen. Right. And let me say, this holy, this pure, the most devout Jew that ever lived, the most law-abiding man who ever lived, will not settle for less than a holy bride. That's right. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conduct. As he which hath called you is holy. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what Jesus lived. That's what He demonstrated. The apostles understood it. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all lawlessness, mm -hmm. all anomia, and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish, the righteousness of the law. Revelation 19.7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of holy people. Yep. Saints. Hagios. Means sacred. Means physically pure. Morally blameless. Ceremonially consecrated. Saint. The righteousness of saints. He wants us to not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, did Jesus go and eat and drink with sinners? Jesus was a holy rabbi. Everybody stood in awe of Him. The centurion sent the elders of Israel to ask Him to come and heal His servant because He was probably a Gentile. He felt unworthy. He didn't think Jesus... He told you, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Jesus wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't have gone and ate with him, but he'd heal his daughter. But he felt unworthy of that. He understood. Yep. When that woman came and said, my daughter has a devil. She, she was a Gentile. Jesus set the situation straight, made sure she understood the situation before he healed her daughter. That's right. You didn't find Jesus at the tailgate party. No. You don't find Jesus out on the beach just wanting to you know, be a good old boy so he can influence people. Show him that he loved him. <laughs> he was the most upright, devout, holy, law-abiding Jew that ever lived. Amen. Never broke one jot or tittle of God's law. The best reflection you can see of his thoughts, his intentions, his attitude is to read every word of God yes. because that's what he lived by. That's right. And the people who present this good old boy Jesus are presenting another Jesus. Yep. That's right. 
A Jesus who does not save. You can't follow that Jesus and go to the heaven of this Jesus. Right. We're going to an every word heaven, following an every word Savior, by living an every word life, having an every word church, so that we can be His every word bride. Amen. Let's stand together. How foolish to think that Jesus lived one way and His apostles lived and taught another way. You want to see a real reflection of Jesus? Number one, the Gospels were written by the apostles. Yeah. If the apostles didn't get it, then they would have represented it wrong in the Gospels. Right. Okay? The same ones who wrote the epistles wrote the Gospels. The apostles of Christ. There's so much deception in our world today. Yeah. Any thoughts before we go to prayer? Well, the thought was along the line of if Jesus was just partying with unrepentant sinners, um, or a partying period, then for Peter to say, I perceive that God has no respect to a person, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him, would mean nothing. Because if the unrepentant and unrighteous are accepted too, what's the big deal? Right. Right. He'd say it means nothing to God. The general public of Christendom know a few little cliches here and there that keeps getting repeated over the pulpits. They don't know the Word of God. When they read about Peter saying nothing unclean is entered in my mouth, they'll say, oh yeah, there's Peter. He never got it. Doesn't he know that not that which goeth into a man defiles him, but that which cometh out? Doesn't he know that? Yeah, he knew exactly what Jesus That's meant right. too. The devil is using those people to try to de, um, to not to not make them sensitive to God's word. They can feel good about themselves, and of course, if the preacher's doing it, then you know, then the people are just going to follow suit. I mean, that makes sense over this. It's, it's nothing more than just a comp total compromise of God's word. It's sad. Makes me mad. Mm -hmm. The devil loves when people give a false character to Jesus yeah. to enable sinners, to embolden sinners, yeah. to, to, like Ezekiel in Ezekiel, you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of evildoers that they should not return from their wickedness by promising them life. Uh -huh. And that's the purpose. That's what's going on.